A Zombie Trilogy is a documentary telling of the story behind Call of Duty Zombies, utilizing elements of the video games commonly uploaded to YouTube, remixed in a fashion reminiscent of news media as if the stories were real, and such utilization is considered fair use. This channel does not own the rights to, nor is officially affiliated with Call of Duty, which is the property of Activision. Much effort has been made to be respectful of Activision and Content ID whilst making this complete documentary. A Zombie Trilogy incorporates the stories of real historical figures and celebrities mentioned within the games, but it does not reflect the state of the real world in which said figures reside. A huge thank you to Mr. Dally JD for supporting this series with his video footage. Please check him out. The Call of Duty series is mostly known for creating gritty gun games on an annual basis but the company Treyarch has gone through great lengths to create the most ridiculous and convoluted science fantasy gun game story known to mankind. Treyarch's Call of Duty Zombies Many of you might have tried to play this game, and many of you might have asked yourself what in the world is going on. After years of collaboration with many bright minds on the internet, I am here to lay every recording and important dialogue chronologically to explain the entire story. That's right, the entire story. Everything related to zombies from the first release in World at War to the most recent in Black Ops 3. Since a multitude of companies develop Call of Duty, concurrent stories are told by Treyarch's partners, each of which is said to have its own universe or universes, many of which were inspired by Call of Duty zombies. This story embraces the multiverse concept, telling tales that branch universes, timelines, realities, dimensions, and realms. Because of the overlapping definitions of all of these words, this story will refer to each plane of existence as a realm for the purposes of consistency. Any realm that has no name will be given a Greek letter to represent it. Thank you, and enjoy. The Ether Agartha in the beginning, there was nothing. The infinite expanse of the void was known by many names, including the Ether, the Beyond, Agartha, and Argatha. Ethereal energy could be found throughout the Ether. Within the Ether were at least 63 universes, as well as a being known as the First One. It was not omniscient, but it did possess indirect pseudo-omnipotence. It created an artifact called the Summoning Key, which it used to imbue life energy into all of the universes, each in its own way. It quietly watched over all life, interfering only indirectly. The 63rd Universe The Alpha Realm The 63rd Universe was host to sentient, pseudo-humanoid life forms called Keepers, who reigned as the dominant life forms of the universe for an immeasurably long time. The first one chose to give the sentient beings free will. The Keepers created a religion that revolved around something called the Black Sun. Eventually, some of the minds of the Keepers were corrupted through their choice to use ethereal energy emanating from the Aether. The corrupted Keepers banded together and fought a great war against the other Keepers in the 63rd universe. Many Keepers participated in the Great War on one side or the other, but some did not. Some Keepers hid themselves away by creating a pocket universe that would one day be known as the Crazy Place. The Corrupted Keepers lost the Great War, and they were expelled from the 63rd universe into the depths of the Aether, whereas the Victorious Keepers ascended to become wards of all universes. Eons Past The Corrupted Keepers survived in the Aether, evolving into evil of crafty and horrors that had a desire to consume all life. They became known as the Apothecons, led by the most monstrous of them, the Overlords. The Keepers that had been victorious in the Great War were favored by the First One, and they had abilities that appeared to be magic. They created many artifacts, including transference devices, that allowed them to pass through universes. They evolved, bearing little resemblance to their original forms, and they named themselves the Ancient Order of the Keepers serving as watchful protectors of the 63rd universe and preventing the Apothecons from entering any universe. They conjured a book called the Cronorium, which contained accounts of their ancient past. 
The Keepers in the Crazy Place evolved over time as well, and they became known simply as the Ancients. The remaining Keepers that did not participate in the Great War hid within the 63rd universe, eventually settling within the Virgo Supercluster, within the local group, within the Milky Way galaxy, on the third planet from Sol, which would eventually be known as Earth. They evolved into tall humanoid beings known as the Vrilya, and they made up for a lack of magical abilities with fantastic technology powered by a miraculous substance called Vril. On Earth in the ancient past, the Vril Generator, a device that had an incredibly large, perhaps infinite supply of Vril, was created, along with many other Keeper technologies, including several pyramid devices that could alter space and time. One pyramid device was the center of a site called Shangri-La in the Himalayas, and another was under the Alps. Another floated in space, and another was on the surface of the Earth's moon. At one point, the Vrilya moved the pyramid in Shangri-La to Mars. Eventually, however, it was moved back, taking a Martian mountain back with it, leaving a single Martian mountain amongst the Himalayas. Around this time, large mythical beasts known as dragons lived on the Earth. Eventually, humans themselves evolved on the Earth, not knowing of the happenings in the universe around them. At some point, the first one befriended a mortal being. The mortal became a good friend of the first one, capable of making it laugh with humor frequently. However, the mortal too became corrupted by the influence of the ether through the Apothecon's doing. It turned on the first one and was immortalized as an ancient evil. It would eventually become known by many names, including the Great Dragon, the Beast, Michelantikutli, Beelzebub, Lucifer, Satan, and the Devil. But it existed to act as an agent on behalf of the overlords of the Apothecons. Around the time humans began to dominate the Earth, the Vril Yah and the dragons both mysteriously disappeared and became legends, but humans began to reside within the remains of Shangri-La. In the first century, the island of Pompeii in the Pacific Ocean became inhabited by human people as well, where they built a civilization known as Nan Madal. In the early Middle Ages, the Snake Kingdom comprised a powerful army. Their leaders resided within the Citadel. The kingdom had mystic traditions that may have proved real, and they acquired possession of the Crenorium and held onto it throughout their reign. Warriors from the Lion Kingdom, wearing large suits of enchanted armor, invaded the Citadel. The Lion Kingdom was wiped out, but the Snake Kingdom was left weak and soon after collapsed. The Crenorium remained in the Citadel, waiting to be rediscovered. Much later, in the year 1118, a militant Christian force called the Knights Templar was formed. From 1147 to 1149, the Templars participated in the Second Crusade. Meanwhile, in the Alps was a wolf kingdom led by a man known as the Wolf King because of his two loyal wolf companions. Unfortunately, one of them died for unknown reasons, but the Wolf King made the two wolves as the symbol of his kingdom. Near Bar-le-Duc, France, the Templars discovered ruins belonging to the ancients. They excavated the ruins and found portals that led to the crazy place. The Templars created a relationship with the Ancients and kept knowledge of the Ancients secret. The Ancients possessed advanced technology, including four powerful elemental staves. They adopted a similar dress of the Templars to appease them. Around this time, a legendary group of four people appeared, having traveled from far in the future. They were called Primus, and they consisted of an American, a Russian, a Japanese, and a German. Primus immediately obtained the elemental staves when they appeared before the Templars, who revered Primus. Soon after Primus arrived, the Apothecons entered the 63rd universe from a giant force portal above the Alps and attacked. The Keepers immediately began to repel their attack, but it wasn't enough. The Apothecons came in many horrific Lovecraftian forms, but they all possessed a ceaseless desire to consume the energy of life and corrupt the universe. Whenever Apothecans consumed life energy, whether it be a living organism or a person's very soul, the Apothecans did the equivalent of digestion, excreting a dangerous substance known as Element 115. Element 115 wasn't supposed to exist, which worried the first one, who still refused to intervene directly. In its purest form, Element 115 glowed a bright blue, but in trace amounts of ore, it glowed a dark red although it could be converted to function and appear for many different purposes, 
for element 115 defied the very physics of the 63rd universe. Element 115 even reanimated dead cells and in large quantities reanimated whole bodies. However, in living tissue, element 115 interfered with the workings of the mind and was capable of causing memory loss, delusions, and paranoia. Simply being near element 115 was enough to feel the side effects. During the great battle of the Apothecons versus the Keepers and Humanity, the Apothecons excreted element 115 that reanimated undead zombies, which aided the Apothecons in their quest to consume. Primus assisted the Templars in their fight against the zombies, but Primus left for the Alps to fight the source of the Apothecons. The Ancients in the Crazy Place found that they were vulnerable to the invasion, and many of them became ancient zombies that attacked the Templars. In the Alps, the Wolf King led his army to fight the Apothecons along with his loyal wolf companion. A knight named Pablo Marinus was returning from the Crusades when he was forced to join the fight against the Apothecons. But then Primus arrived and saved Pablo. Primus went into the great battle with the Wolf King and they fought bravely. Primus and the Keepers managed to seal the portal and defeat the Apothecons in the Alps, but much of the Wolf King's army lay dead. The Wolf King himself, along with his beloved wolf, was killed in battle. He and his son, who had also fought in the battle, had a touching moment as the crown passed from father to son. Primus told the new king to build his castle in that exact spot, and they never saw Primus again. Primus then embarked on a mission to eliminate the surviving Apothecons that were now trapped in the 63rd universe. Some Apothecons fled to the South Pacific and attacked the island of Pompeii in an effort to consume it. To protect Pompeii, its people, and their world, four people in Pompeii volunteered to be sacrificed to a keeper. The keeper took their four skulls as well as his own and used their combined magic and life energy to destroy the Apothecons, saving the island. Eventually, all of the Apothecons in the 63rd universe were destroyed or repelled and the invasion was a total failure. There was one exception. One giant apothecon survived by hiding beneath the Pacific Ocean near Pompeii. Primus returned to Barladuk and used their staffs to cleanse the zombie epidemic in some fashion. Eventually, Primus died heroically, with the American dying last. His dying words indicated his hope that they saved the future and not brought about its ruin, and that Primus had found a secret place that not even the first one knew. In the aftermath, all of the ancients were now ancient zombies, so the Templars destroyed the portals to the crazy place, quarantining them. The zombie plague was stopped, and the Templars built huge monuments of Primus to remember their sacrifice. The people of Pompeii built a tomb and shrine to honor the sacrifice of the Keeper, as well as the four humans who died to save them. They memorialized the Keeper, naming it Non Sapwe. In the Alps, the son of the Wolf King built a castle as instructed, naming it Der Eisendraka. And under his rule, many knights and keepers that fought in the great battle were ceremoniously buried. He preferred dragon myths over wolves, but he kept records of the great battle and told the story to his own son many years later. In 1312, the Templars were violently dismantled and ceased to be. Much later, on April 14, 1639, J. Frank was born. He lived his life religiously and became an important religious figure to some Christians in Europe. He died on June 19, 1694, and he was buried in a casket with a relatively impressive tombstone. Sometime later, his tomb was transferred to North America for religious reasons. By the 1700s, Sir Isaac Newton, an incredible scientist and alchemist, discovered element 115. In secret, he wrote Newton's cookbook, in which he wrote of his experiments where he distilled element 115 into weaponized candy gumballs called gobblegums. Around this time, the Masaki family of Japan was a wealthy and powerful dynasty, with many of their family becoming notable samurai and bushi. Sometime between the 1830s and 1860s, a western town was built within the United States of America, and the tomb of J. Frank was present in the town. In 1851, Michael Faraday left his last position in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland as an electrochemist. He was the inventor of the designs behind the motor, transformer, and generator, and he was married to a woman named Sarah Faraday. 
They later bought an estate in the quiet western town and visited often. Michael brought the wealth he accrued as an inventor to the town, and he brought the invention of electricity to the town, installing a power grid. On August 25th, 1867, Michael died while he was in the United Kingdom, leaving Sarah a mourning widow. In 1871, Sir Edward George Earl Bulwer Lytton claimed to have found the Vrilya. He wrote a book about it, announcing them to the world, but the world never was able to verify the book as accurate. Sarah Faraday was miserable without her beloved husband, and she eventually moved back to London, although she missed the western town. In 1879, she succumbed to death as well. On October 15, 1887, the western town's church's priest William died and was ceremoniously buried. In April 1888, B. Hush was hanged in the town for an unknown crime. Meanwhile, in the ether, the Apothecons were recuperating from their loss. The life energy they had consumed in the great battle long ago accumulated in the form of Element 115. The ancient evil arranged for what little Element 115 they had to be sent in the form of meteors with concentrated Element 115 ore into the 63rd universe as part of a long-term plan to corrupt humanity. On June 30th, 1908, the first of these meteors fell to the Earth. It explored shortly before impact upon the Siberian expanse of the Russian Empire. Around this time, four children were born that had the potential to change the world. They were Dempsey, Nikolai Belinsky, Takeo Masaki, and Edward Richtofen. Takeo Masaki was the youngest of the Masaki family in Japan. His family gave him a katana, the Path of Sorrows, when he was five years old. He often played with it in the streets, slicing the tails off of kittens, and his family was convinced that he would bring honor to their name. When he grew older, he had the phrase, Life is light when compared to honor, tattooed on the inside of his eyelids. Edward Richthofen grew up in an orphanage within the German Empire. Others called him Eddie, and sometimes Teddy. When he told the other children that his parent was a famous scientist, the children scrawled upon the wall, Teddy is a liar. In 1914, World War I began, although at the time it was known simply as another Great War. In 1918, World War I ended. In 1919, the German Empire had a revolution that turned it into the Weimar Republic. In 1922, a civil war transformed the Russian Empire into the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or Soviet Union. Richthofen attended Heidelberg University in the Weimar Republic to get a medical degree, and he secretly had homosexual relations with his roommate. After he graduated, Dr. Edward Richthofen became a politically affluent back-alley plastic surgeon and attracted many Weimar socialites as friends. He developed a fragile ego and began to have difficulty sleeping without a teddy bear. Meanwhile, Nikolai Bolinsky had a brother and a sister at home in Russia but he left his family to travel Europe for his dream of becoming a writer. He wrote about his travels and he met a woman. They married and lived happily for some time, but a bombing incident killed her. Nikolai turned to drinking vodka to forget his past, and he quit trying to be a writer. He changed careers to that of a politician in the Soviet Union. In 1933, the Nazi party gained control of Germany, turning the Weimar Republic into the Greater German Reich, or Nazi Germany. Richthofen's political aspirations were ruined, and he turned his attention to science. Although Nikolai didn't fully understand the benefits of communism, he became a vigilant supporter and crafty politician who moved his way up the ranks of government by killing the next person in line and marrying politically. When things went wrong, he had a habit of killing his wives. He killed his second wife with a shotgun, third with a sickle, fourth with strangling in a shotgun, and fifth by drowning and beheading with an axe. However, Nikolai's fifth wife had an affair with a high-ranking politician who began using rumors to tarnish Nikolai's reputation, ruining his political career. Even Soviet General Secretary Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin heard the rumors and feared the politician who could murder with such ease. On September 1, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland, leading many countries to declare war, plunging the world into World War II. When the war started, Stalin sent Nikolai to the front lines of the war in an effort to rid himself of Nikolai. 
The government of Nazi Germany, the Reichstag High Command, acquired six Wunderwaffe programs to have an edge in the war. The first Wunderwaffe was the Uranium Club, which was a nuclear energy project whose purpose was to weaponize nuclear fission technology. The second Wunderwaffe was the Aggregate Rocket Series, most importantly the A9 to A12 models, all of which were designed for the purposes of transporting satellites into low Earth orbit. The most prominent of the A9 to A12 models was the V2 rocket, the first projectile to reach space. The third Wunderwaffe was the DGS-228 and 346, proposed rocket-powered aircraft that would culminate in the development of supersonic reconnaissance planes. The fourth Wunderwaffe was the rocket U-boat, a submarine designed to carry and fire ballistic missiles. The fifth Wunderwaffe was the Land Cruiser P-1500 Monster, a 1,000-ton tank that would act as a transport for the 800mm Schur Gustav artillery gun, the largest ever fired. There were two related organizations at the time in Eastern Europe, Group 601 and Group 935. Group 601 was a secret organization interested in nuclear technology and radio transmissions. Group 935 was a research organization dedicated to improving the human condition, and it was led by Dr. Ludwig Maxis, MD. Maxis had a daughter named Samantha Maxis. He cared deeply for her, and since her mother died, he was a single father. Group 935's headquarters was in Der Ries near Breslau, Lower Silesia, Poland. The facility was built atop the location of one of the Element 115 meteor impact sites. Group 935 began to start developing various wondrous technologies and employing many people of different nationalities. Richthofen went through some tough times, but he became a well-meaning and well-respected scientist, as well as a bit of a sadist with an interest in death and animals. He decided to join Group 935. As the Nazis began to take over much of Europe, the Reichstag High Command approached Group 601 and Group 935 with offers for an exchange of funds for services. Maxis agreed to the arrangement and signed a contract with the Nazi party. Group 935 would make weapons for them in exchange for funding so they could do their real work. Maxis did not like making weapons, but he felt it was necessary. The 6th Wunderwaffe of Germany became the Die Glock which was overseen by Group 935 and rumored to be anything from teleportation to anti-gravity machines. Gentlemen, allow me to take this opportunity to welcome you to Group 935. This is a prestigious moment in the history of our race. You represent the future of technological advancement. You are the pioneers of human discovery. In your hands lies the destiny of mankind. In our hands is a great power, and with that power comes a price. You have volunteered to be part of this great experiment, and with that decision comes the responsibility of absolute secrecy. No one is to know what you do where you work, what our research has uncovered, or what our purpose will be. You will have no further contact with your governments or with your families. Your decision to fully dedicate your lives to Group 935 is absolute. In your lockers you will find your field ops manual which will direct you should our manifesto get compromised. We cannot afford to let this power fall into the wrong hands, and therefore the field ops manual should be considered your Bible. Make your preparations now. A new dawn is beginning for mankind. Log entry 38, date. December 4, 1939. The matter transference prototype is prepared for test run number 151. We have now reduced our test subject's mass to prove that this is possible. Dr. Schuster, please give an overview. Yes, Dr. Richthofen. We have the new test subject, a walnut, weighing in at 10 grams. The target platform is now at 3 feet with no obstructions. We have one microgram of the element which, according to our calculations, will be entirely used up during tests. 
Excellent, Dr. Schuster. Commence test number 151. Yes, Doctor. Uh, please, insert your earplugs. Powered up the prototype and have moved a walnut directly from the prototype device into the receiving device. It moved instantly. It. it teleported. Get me Dr. Maxis immediately. By December 4th, 1939, Rick Tofa and another scientist, Dr. Schuster, commenced 150 tests on a matter transference prototype. Using a microgram of element 115, Richtofen and Schuster used the prototype teleporter that they invented to teleport a walnut weighing 10 grams 3 feet away. Test 151 was successful. But this is not the crucial experiments that you are supposed to be working on. With all due respect, Dr. Massis, this is a breakthrough of unimaginable proportions. What? That you moved a walnut a few feet? Yes, Edward. We will improve the human condition by revolutionizing the walnut industry. I can see it now. Edward's walnut delivery. Don't be obtuse. How dare you call me that? We are at war, Edward. I will admit that there is promise here. But until this war is won... Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Maxis. But Group 935 is a research organization. What was the motto? To improve the human condition? What business of ours is this war? Fine, Dr. Richtofen. I will let you in on a little administrative secret. We are finalizing a deal with the Nazi party. We need funding. We need equipment. They need new weapons. Chances are this war will end soon with a treaty or two, and we will be in a much better position to help the world. Are you certain this won't cause massive defections? We have scientists from all over the world working with us. That is why it is with the utmost confidence that I share this with you. No one will know of this. This is simply the breaking of an egg to make an omelet. Think of the tactical advantage we would have. Think of the cost. Think of the time. We can provide the Nazis technical expertise in various areas without putting all our eggs in your walnut basket. Good day, Edward, and get back to your real work. Bloody jerk. I think Dr. Maxis has lost his perspective. No matter. We'll do this on our own and publish the findings before he has a chance to. You're not suggesting that Dr. Maxis would steal this technology and perfect it without us, are you? I would by no means discourage that thought. Great scientists must stick together and achieve great science. Richtofen told Maxis about the innovation, but Maxis was not pleased. He believed the teleporter to be a waste of resources and that nothing beneficial would come of it. Maxis also confided in Richthofen about the contract with the Reichstag High Command. Richthofen thought that the teleporters could aid Nazi Germany significantly, and that Maxis might be lying about his disapproval in order to steal his work. So Richthofen and Schuster continued to work on the teleporter despite Maxis's objections. Richthofen and Schuster spent the next month making rapid advancements to the teleporter prototype. Entry 42. Date, January 4, 1940. Dr. Schuster and I, despite mounting pressure from Dr. Maxis, have continued working on the matter transference prototype. We have made great strides in the last 30 days and are ready for our first human subject. If our calculations are correct, we will send a test subject, me, to the receptacle station sitting 30 yards away and behind a cindy block wall. Are you certain you want to do this, Dr. Richtofen? Nein, Dr. Schuster. But this must be done. Quickly. Put in your earplugs and power up the machine. But there are power outage. Why is it so dark? I feel almost weightless. How very unexpected. Dr. Schuster? Hello? There. I can see now. Oh, my God. I'm standing in a circular cave. 
surrounded by some kind of machinery. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. It looks almost alien in nature. There's a pyramid structure in the center of the room. I'm going to try and carefully touch it. <laughs> Static electricity. It's smooth to the touch. Very cold. Not a speck of dust. Hmm. Might be hollow. The chamber is quite large. I see what looks like capacitors in the ceiling of the chamber. But there are no obvious connections to anything electrical. What is this place? Dr. Schuster? Is that you? Dr. Schuster? Look at this. It appears to be covered in some kind of hieroglyphic language. I've not seen anything like it before. Why are you whispering to me? There's no need for that. This is loose. Do you hear that? It sounds like... What happened? I seem to be in some kind of jungle. I can't be certain of where I am. <laughs> On January 4th, 1940, Richtofen volunteered to be its first human subject. However, when he teleported, he did not end up in the receiving receptacle, but instead he found he was within a dark cave within the moon. He saw the ancient pyramid on the moon, notably the cave had oxygen within it, and it had machinery of a non-electrical sort. He also saw strange passages on the ceiling. Then he touched the pyramid. This pyramid had a direct connection with the ether. That ancient evil used this connection to whisper into Richtofen's mind. From that moment forward, Richtofen heard other voices in his head as the ancient evil manipulated his actions throughout the rest of his life unbeknownst to even Richtofen himself. He was then teleported away to Shangri-La. While Richtofen was in Shangri-La, he made diplomatic relations with the local people, although it was mostly due to them likely believing him to be a god. Log entry 43. Date, January 23rd, 1940. I cannot be certain what happened to Dr. Richtofen once the test was commenced. He just disappeared from the machine into thin air. I have searched the area for days and have no evidence that he is anywhere. I am afraid I might have to scrap the... Not scrap anything. We've done something. Something wondrous. Shh! Do you hear them? Dr. Richtofen, you're alive. I'm more than alive, Mr. Schuster. Is the device still intact? Yes, but what happened to you? Ah, oh, something wonderful. That chamber was incredible. The wonders we can learn. What are you talking about? Are you all right? Get in the matter transference prototype, Dr. Schuster. We have worked. By January 23rd, 1940, Schuster had nearly given up all hope of Richtofen's return since his disappearance through the teleporter, when suddenly Richtofen arrived at Der Ries. Richtofen claimed they had much work to be done. During the next few years, Group 935 busily worked and created new inventions. Richtofen continued his research into the teleporter, or as he called it, the matter transference device, or MTD. Maxis grudgingly continued the teleporter experiment, supervising the tests, but Richtofen was vital because he knew how to recalibrate the teleporters, whereas Maxis did not. Initiating test number three, Subject is within the test chamber. Activate power. Oh, oh my god. Can you hold yourself and clean that up? Test number three. Unsuccessful. Test subject has been reduced to the same state as previous subjects. Clean up the test chamber and recalibrate the system. Let's do it again. Yes, doctor. Maxis went through three unsuccessful tests on trying to get the teleporter to work. Maxis's tests 1, 2, and 3 all resulted in piles of guts and flesh. Maxis brought his daughter, Samantha, to live with him in the Darius facility. To alleviate any feelings of loneliness she might get, he gave her a dog, and she named her Fluffy. Now, you must be very diligent, Mr. Samantha. Owning a dog is a great responsibility. Yes, Father. 
Oh, I love her. You must feed her every day and walk her and be very careful when you play with her. You know she's going to have puppies. Really? Can I keep the puppies too, Father? We'll see, Samantha. One step at a time. As an adult, Dempsey enlisted in the United States Marine Corps, and he became well known for his physical prowess, earning him the nickname Tank. He once bet $50 that he could eat 50 eggs in 15 minutes, after which he learned what it felt to fear for one's own life. He trained extensively with his arms in particular. He earned the world record for the most consecutive one-arm push-ups, and he was able to throw a grenade faster than baseball players could throw baseballs. In 1942, Tank had to leave his young child behind in the United States when he was sent to fight the Japanese in the Pacific. On January 20, 1942, Maxis completed the Dayton Betty and Stetter, which was the computer network of Darius. The same year, the Uranium Club was disbanded due to lack of funding. Richtofen did not trust nor like Maxis anymore, and Richtofen had begun to do many things behind Maxis's back. Richtofen managed to get a backing of scientists that felt his direction was better for Group 935 than Maxis. Richtofen established a 935 outpost on the remains of the castle Der Eisendrache in the Austrian Alps. Richtofen and his supporters operated there, calling it by a code name, Eagle's Nest. Maxis and Samantha visited Der Eisendrache rarely, and when Maxis did, Richtofen and his supporters put on a facade to hide their intentions. By this time at Eagle's Nest, Richtofen finished his teleporter, which he had used to teleport to the moon and back as much as he wished. In doing so, he secretly organized a now-complete workforce on his new base of operations on the moon, known as Griffin Station. Construction lasted about two years. Gentlemen, for two long years we have toiled here and at Eagle's Nest to build our fortifications. For two long years we have taken equipment to build up our labs. For two long years we have worked under Group 935, believing that Dr. Maxis truly wants to help the world. For two long years we've led a double life. Today, that all ends. I bring to you what this project is all about. What I have worked to keep from my enemy. What is it, Dr. Richtofen? It looks alien. It is an ancient drill machine. And you, Dr. Groff, are now the lead scientist here at Griffin Station. You will be the one to discover how it works. We first must discover what it does. Nine, Dr. Groff. I know what it does. It has a direct connection to another dimension. It's preposterous. No more preposterous than teleporting all of this gear to the moon or to building Griffin Station. Is it? I suppose not. How do you know what it does? I have found many interesting real artifacts here. I have decoded some of their language. All signs point to this device being a stable gateway to the ether. Dr. Richthofen. I'm aware of a project being run by Dr. Maxis at Derice concerning Brill. As am I. I am going back to my post at Group 935 to continue the charade. I will be finding out just how much information Dr. Maxis has on Brill. Once the machine is operational, I will enact my plan on return. Gentlemen, let the games begin. When Griffin Station was finally completed in 1943, Richtofen announced to the rebellious Group 935 workers that they were to work in Griffin Station from now on, and he revealed the pyramid, or as Richtofen called it, the Multidimensional Pyramid Device, or MPD. He assigned Dr. Groff to be the leader of Griffin Station, and Richtofen continued to work for Maxis. Maxis did not know what Richtofen had done, but he became suspicious. Richtofen also found some real artifacts on the moon alongside the MPD, like the Vril Generator. Richtofen led two lives. He had his real purposes and his guise at Darius. He enlisted in the Nazi party, and he even became involved with the Illuminati, a secret organization bent on world domination. Mr. Log, 1075. Dr. Schuster and I have spent countless hours with the pyramid device in an attempt to understand how it functions. 
we have made little progress until now. Today, we uncovered what looks to be some kind of tank with a glass-like front. The glass itself seems... I've got you now, Rat. Kill it, little stuff. <laughs> Did you see that? Look, the capacitor is illuminated. The tank is filling the machine. It seems to be activated. What did you do? I think we just discovered what powers this machine. At Griffin Station, Schuster and Groff found out that life energy powered the MPD. Over the next few years, many advancements were made in Group 935. Group 935 acquired a new facility that functioned as a theater, showcase, and experimentation lab known as Kino Der Toten. Maxis and other scientists at Dairies occasionally made visits to Kino Der Toten. Samantha made two friends there named Abigail and Amelia. Maxis was still trying to get the teleporters at Dairies working, despite Richtofen having already having working teleporters installed in Griffin Station. Maxis and Richtofen commenced test 4 on the teleporter at Dairies and finally got it mostly working. Edward, tie the damn thing down! We can't have it running around during the test! It's tied down now, Dr. Maxis. Initiating test number five. Subject is within the test chamber. Activate power. Searching for Vitus. No reading, Doctor. The subject has disappeared. Dr. Maxis, we've done it! Don't be foolish! Test number five is unsuccessful. Subject has vanished, yes, but has not reappeared at the mainframe. Recalibrate the damn system! Now! They then commenced test five using a dog, but the dog didn't reappear at the mainframe this time. All of this was made possible with Element 115, so Group 935 scientists scoured the globe for the other Element 115 meteor impact sites. And they found Shinonuma, Japan, Nagasaki, Soviet Union, Groom Lake, Area 51, Nevada, United States, and the Moon, which was confirmed via Group 935's astronomical team, all had such sites. After studying ancient Vril artifacts, Maxis managed to create the Pack-a-Punch, a mysterious device that could upgrade most weapons into more powerful varieties using magic, Vril, or Element 115. Scientists working for Group 935 then began to notice that Element 115 reanimated dead cells. The Showa Emperor Hirohito of Japan also became intrigued in Germany's research of Element 115, so he saw to the formation of Division 9, whose duty was to investigate strange scientists that could help Japan win the war. Division 9's first installation was the Rising Sun facility at Shinonuma, the location of Japan's Element 115 meteor impact site. Shionuma was located within Manchuria, but in acquired Japanese territory. Since Japan was an ally of Germany in World War II, Division 9 and Group 935 formed an alliance. Division 9 made designs for an energy weapon, and Group 935 seized the designs. Maxis then built the Ray Gun in Deris. Group 935 scientist Dr. H. Porter was then tasked with the Ray Gun from that time forward. Richtofen also created a weapon, the Wunderwaffe DG-2 which utilized Element 115, electricity, and a miniature anti-gravity mechanism. Richtofen later wrote a book detailing the mechanics of the Wunderwaffe DG-2 and the pack a punch version of it, the Wunderwaffe DG-3JZ, in an attempt to promote his invention. Meanwhile, Kinyar Dertoen received a working teleporter from Dairies as well as a smaller pocket teleporter. Stand up! Stand up! Good. Look at me. Over here. Good. Now walk forward. Excellent. Further. Keep coming. It's all right. Stay there. Calm down. I order you. Kill it. Bring me another. Inevitably, Element 115 began to reanimate zombies. The Reichstag High Command commended the discovery of the zombies, and they dubbed the zombie army as the Army Anton. Group 935 tried repeatedly to get the zombies to listen to commands, using mind control techniques at Kinder Toten, 
they couldn't break what they called the trust barrier. The test subjects have been undergoing treatment for five days with little progress. I have been assured that given time, the programming will take hold. In the past weeks, we have made great strides in breaking through to their subconscious. I have had the projectionist make edits to the film. These changes have been very effective. Only one zombie showed any progress of listening to commands, and that zombie was named Subject 26. Subject 26 has had a breakthrough. He is responding to the treatment and following basic instructions. The violent outbursts have been greatly reduced, and given time, we feel this method of treatment will be 100% effective in most cases. Our timeline for deployment can be accelerated. Given the progress we have made in the past two weeks, if patient 26 can retain the impressions longer than 26 hours, we will have the process perfect. Subject 26 was progressing through experiments in Kinerdertoen when a fire alarm activated with bright lights and loud noises, causing Subject 26 to go berserk, and his handler had to kill him, setting back progress on breaking the trust barrier. Another setback. Patient 26 was killed this morning in a field test. He lost control and attacked one of our handlers. His injuries were minor, but patient 26 was destroyed. The break in programming coincided with the flashing lights and loud noises of the fire alarm in the test facility. One moment. What is it? Maxis was secretly worried about purposefully creating zombies. Nevertheless, Group 935 acquired another facility, the Vittenau Sanatorium, which was converted into a zombie testing and experimentation facility. The experiments were so gruesome that many scientists began calling it Verrucht as a joke. The scientists at Verrucht used Element 115 to create soft drinks that were capable of giving powers to ordinary humans. They created a marketing plan using elaborately designed machines, posters, flavors, and catchy jingles. They created four flavors of these Perks Cola, specifically Juggernog, Speed Cola, Double Tap Root Beer, and Quick Revive. And they managed to convince the scientists at Dairies to put some designs in a jingle on the pack a punch. This is Eagle's Nest. Status update, over. Hello, Doctor. They have the shipment and are carrying out your orders. <laughs> All in the name of science, Dr. Graf. Continue until the tanks are full. Yes, Doctor. May God have mercy on us all. Richtofen began sending prisoners to Griffin Station to be killed to power the MPD. In 1944, a subdivision of Groove 935 was created with the purpose of developing a deadly war chemical. Dr. Friedrich Steiner combined two gases, Tabon and Sarin, to create Nova 6. Scientists used Nova 6 at Kinyardertoen to create a mutant variant of zombies called gas zombies. After showing valor in the Pacific, Tank Dempsey became a war hero. That same year, the Battle of Pelalau began in Japanese territory. Four ray guns appeared in the battle by unknown means. However, Tank gained even more notoriety when his unit was captured by the Japanese in Pelalau, and he gnawed his way through his bamboo cage and killed his captors with a bobby pin and his medal of honor. Meanwhile, Nikolai became a hardened soldier, drinking vodka to ease his pain. He married four more times, but each marriage ended in a peaceful, albeit tense divorce. Takeo also fought as a Bushido warrior for Japan, and he fought in the invasion of Manchuria. Sophia, this letter is to go to the Reichstag High Command immediately. Gentlemen, it is with the utmost urgency that I draw your attention to the lack of funding being injected into the giant project. While I believe we are close to realizing the ultimate plan, we still have several years of development before it is ready. It would be folly to cut our expenditure so early in our development. As you know... Early tests on the DG2 have easily outperformed expectations, and we fully anticipate mass-producing the Wunderwaffe within the next few years. Work on the matter transference has, however, come to a standstill. 
We simply do not have enough element 115 to continue the experiments. The test subjects have survived the teleportation, but are currently unresponsive to commands and cannot be controlled. If we are to overcome this obstacle, we need to increase the frequency and size of the experiment. To this end, I suggest we find not only a regular supply of 115, but that we also find a larger conduit to channel the energy. Our operatives in America have informed us that the U.S. has a large supply of the element at the Nevada base. So time is of the essence if we are to stay ahead of them. This cannot be done if you cut the budget, nor can it be done if you insist on pressuring us into action before we are ready. I am, of course, available for discussion on the matter, but in the meantime, I will continue with the work here and try to win this damned war. Signed, etc., etc., Dr. Maxis. The Reichstag High Command began to pressure Group 935 by withholding funding, and Maxis urged them to continue to fund the program. He also told them that the teleporters were functioning, but he said that they were at a standstill due to not having enough Element 115 to continue the experiments. The Wunderwaffe DG2, he also mentioned, was completely functional, but it needed a couple years to be mass-produced. Meanwhile, Max had continued to become more suspicious of Richtofen, but he dismissed it as a side effect of Element 115, disrupting his thoughts. In the hopes of acquiring more Element 115, Max has authorized a Group 935 cargo ship to establish a base on the coast of northern Siberia in the Soviet Union, where a considerable number of fragments from the exploded Tunguska meteor were. Dr. Harvey Yina, SED, was among the scientists sent to the area. There, he invented his own personal weapon with Element 115, the Scavenger. The scientists there researched some real artifacts that Max has provided for them, and they finalized a weapon utilizing it, the VR-11. Max has also found a rare real artifact himself, called the Egg. His tests on the Egg accomplished nothing, and so Richtofen stole it and took it to Griffin's station without Max's realizing. Richtofen also kept Shangri-La as a Group 935 base of operations. He modernized it using various technologies, and he used the locals as a labor force. An Element 115 meteor had also crashed there in Shangri-La on top of the pyramid. Richtofen tried finding focusing crystals in an attempt to utilize the meteor, but he didn't have enough of them. Maxis created a tool that could shrink things using Element 115. The natives of Shangri-La named it using their conglomerated language that, when visually anglicized, appeared to read as 3179 JGB215. Also, a non-working prototype of another weapon, the Thunder Gun Mark I, was created. It was still experiencing quite a few problems, however. Richtofen also acquired his own research center, the Richtofen Center for Clinical Research. The patients referred to Richtofen as the butcher, and it was most likely a front for some kind of experimentation. Richtofen's favorite patient was patient 13225. Also, a small Group 935 facility was set up in Paris, France, near the Eiffel Tower. Meanwhile, Group 935 speculated that the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, or HARP, of the United States was secretly established and powered by Element 115. On May 8, 1945, Germany surrendered to the Allies. By this time, Group 935 still hadn't broken the trust barrier, and the Army Antoine was put into capsule-like storage containers until they could be properly controlled. Maxis believed that they could study the effects of Element 115 on living test subjects, and so he delegated the matter to Richtofen. Richtofen captured three people of different nationalities. He captured Nikolai, Takeo, and a Mexican who just so happened to be a descendant of Pablo Marinus. Richtofen took the subjects from Eagle's Nest to the Siberian outpost, and he also gave Takeo the codename N3WB. Maxis never realized it, but on the occasions that he and Samantha visited Der Eisendraka, Richtofen performed experiments on her without her knowledge. Target entry 1471, date September 2nd, 1945. Dying. Another day, another fair. This time, subject N3 WB just completely at the floor. The Russian subject still smells like urine. Even after he was given a bath and de loused twice. And I think I might have killed the specimen from Mexico. His spleen is on the floor and he's not moving anymore. I can verify the certainty, however, that the barrier is not located in the sea. Dr. Max, continue to 
you no matter the cost. I wonder what he might think of the experiment, the little girl. <laughs> hey! Drop that! That's my sleep! Richtofen accidentally killed the Mexican by removing his spleen. Japan was the last Axis country to surrender to the Allies on September 2, 1945, marking the end of World War II. Group 935 struggled to continue without Nazi funding, but they managed. Sometime around this time, Richtofen created his most insane invention yet, the monkey bomb, a weapon utilizing Element 115, a bomb, and a taxidermied monkey corpse that was designed to look like a toy. Dr. Peter McCain was a research assistant based out of Munich, Germany, and an American spy for the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS. His handler, Cornelius Purnell, was stationed at an unknown location owned by Group 935, and he helped insert Peter into Der Ries and Group 935. However, Peter was transferred sometime after that to Verrucht. Peter was unable to contact his superiors regularly in Verrucht, and the OSS feared that he was compromised. So the OSS sent a Marine recon unit to extract Peter. Two B-17 airplanes were sent to Germany, each with a squad of four Marines. But the first B-17 also had the team leader, Tank Dempsey. The first B-17 arrived near Verrucht. Tank went ahead of his team, but the Nazis at Verrucht captured him on September 10, 1945, thinking that he was the spy. September 10th, 1945. Dear diary, today was a good day. The swelling has subsided. The ice helps. They made liverwurst for lunch. It was... I still have not had any luck reprogramming any of the live specimens. Dr. Ma the key to unlocking the human mind will be more easily discovered on someone who isn't dead yet. I am not convinced. The army is stored until I can break this, this trust barrier. Oh, apparently someone in security found a spy in the group. They are delivering him from broke. Place the one that I broke. <laughs> when Peter saw Tank captured, he unleashed the already unstable zombie test subjects and turned off the power. But when he did so, a zombie bit off his arm. He treated it medically before fleeing. Tank's captors also made a safe getaway with Tank. The others weren't so lucky. The other B-17 crashed in a remote field in Germany. Element 115 had actually been sent here and given rise to zombies in the area. The four marines made a last stand this night, known as Nachterenton, 